it's it's just so interesting that here the head of a central bank is giving gold accolades while denigrating the currency that they that they use during a financial collapse basically is saying here that the currency could go to zero gold will skyrocket i've said many many times gold standards suck it's just a way of cheating gold uh, when you come out with some promise to pay gold and it's a lie because they always print more promises than they have uh, so fundamentally so gold and silver have been called honest money for centuries and because it's not a lie they are not a lie all of the currencies are a lie right from the beginning. Even when they're gold backed, they're a lie. Number five, stand ready for a monetary reset. Wow. So what do you think, Mike? Do you agree? Do you agree with that? Hi, everyone. I've got Alan Hibbard with me once again. Alan, how are you doing? I'm great, Mike. Thanks. How are you? Good. So you've got something else for us to look at. Uh, what have you got? Yeah, basically, there's an article here um, from Zero Hedge. Dutch central bank admits it has prepared for a new gold standard. And really, this is part of a growing trend that not only the Dutch central bank, but the eurozone and the implication is the world at large is preparing for a new gold standard. Super big. Yes. Yeah. It is big. Okay. Yeah. I, I did read this article a little while ago and uh, I don't remember that much of it, but I there were some uh, lines in here that were very impactful and right on the mark. And there are also lines that you, uh, that it's, it's just unbelievable that somebody associated with one of the world's central banks is saying this out loud. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I thought it would be great if we actually go through. So there's an article here. I encourage everyone to read it. It's fascinating. We'll go through some highlights of it. And yes, to your point, there is an interview with the head of the Dutch Central Bank. And so many of the things that he says are very telling, the things he says and the things he doesn't say. So I want to go through some of those exact quotes, and then hopefully we can get a sense of where the world is moving. So excellent. Yeah. So, so the first thing is, um, you know, it, this bold here, if there is a financial crisis, the gold price will skyrocket and official gold reserves can be used to underpin a new gold standard, according to DNB, the Dutch Central Bank, the Dutch National Bank. So the next bold thing here, by saying gold will be the safe haven of choice during a financial collapse, DNB confesses its own currency, the euro, does not weather all storms. Indirectly, DNB, so the central bank, encourages people to own gold individually to be protected from financial stock, financial shocks, making the transition towards a gold-based monetary system more likely. So go ahead, Mike. Well, it's uh, it's very, very interesting. You know, gold was uh, raised to a tier one asset uh, several years ago. Uh, so it is uh, one of the foundations of the central banks that do own it. There's a few that don't, but uh, it, it's just so interesting that here the head of a central bank is uh giving gold ad accolades while denigrating the currency that they that they use uh at the same time saying basically that uh during a financial collapse basically is saying here that the currency could go to zero gold will skyrocket now gold is going to skyrocket measured in that currency and it's because the currency is going down absolute purchasing power actually gets transferred from the currency supply to the gold stock during these events. And so it, it's huge gains for anybody that's on the correct side of this event. And it's interesting that, um, you know, <clears throat> we've, we've seen that it seems like the central banks are more and more nervous about their system. And you know that when you've got a, um, a very complex system, that humans are trying to manipulate uh, that wants to be uh, self-correcting and auto-balancing where you're manipulating it. And whenever you manipulate, there's something that you're doing that the free market wouldn't do. Pressures build up. It's another crack in the foundation. And uh, there is the, always the potential of the whole thing eventually imploding. Exactly. And I think they're wise to that. I think they feel it. And yes. as, as we're about to see, they're working together to make sure that they don't have, uh, you know, mutually assured destruction in a financial sense, uh, as, <laughs> as it were. Uh -huh. So I want to like paint the picture with a chart to get us started to, to sh sort of show the trend of what's been happening. This is in the Eurozone. OK, 
And these are total international reserves as a percentage of GDP. And you can see that from 1970, right? So for over the last 50 years, basically since gold became freely traded, the end of the Bretton Woods system, pretty much there's been a convergence. Look how tight all of the, the ratios here are of all these different countries. We've got Austria, Belgium, France, and so on. They're, they're all hovering around 10%. And they're getting tighter and tighter in terms of their band um, over the years. And this can't really happen on accident. I mean, th this has to be an intentional direction to move. What do, what do you think? Uh, well, I see a bunch of different things in the chart here. One of them is uh, that it was increasing throughout the 70s, the, the percentage of gold uh, as of, of their reserves. Gold was an increasing percentage. That was a function of price. Uh, once they, once it became freely traded and it was no longer $42, $42.2222. So $42 and 22.22 cents, uh, which was a ridiculous price. Um, once, uh, Bretton Woods ended and it became free trading, uh, the very fact that the, uh, price goes up while well, it's still measured in that price though, and. I don't know if the European central banks were marking it to market, but I, I don't think that they were accumulating a bunch of gold. It was gold going up in price that caused it to be more of their reserves and then going down in price. But then in the uh, 90s and 2000s, there's sales going on. And it's just interesting that and because this is a, a linear chart, and not logarithmic, uh, it makes the convergence look like more of a convergence than it actually is. But even on a logarithmic chart there would be a convergence uh, with all of them becoming very close together in 2008. But uh, in 2008, the, the change in direction shows a loss in faith by the central banks in the global monetary system. That's what it says to me, and that's the big message here. Gold started rising in 2001, but yet all of the percentage of reserves uh, these central banks were either selling gold or they were uh, taking on more uh, sovereign debt from other countries. They were buying more treasuries and adding to their reserves by buying assets other than gold, meaning gold is a shrinking percentage of the assets from 2001 to 2008. Then in 2008, <laughs> they all go, oh my God, there's, there's a potential that the whole monetary system could one day just implode, you know, just fold. And uh, they're going to that tier one asset that can't vanish. That, you know, when you've got sovereign debt as your asset, if that country defaults on those bonds, <laughs> you, your uh, uh, international reserves basically vanish at that point. And that's something that gold can't do. And it's the only asset that they've got that can't vanish. Exactly. And that's the reason you're seeing it go up. It's distrust in the global financial system. Yeah. And we're going to hear something effectively to that point um, from, from the Dutch uh, uh, head of the central bank himself. Oh, uh, okay. I've got a few, few quotes here. And then we do have another chart I want to show towards the end that really highlights uh, some of the trends we've been seeing even better than this chart. So, so let me get into some of it. And just so people are aware... Uh, well, these are these are some tricky names for me to pronounce, but we've got Art Huben, the director of financial markets for the Dutch Central Bank. Uh, and the interview was conducted by Anna Dickman uh, from something I'm not even going to try to pronounce. OK, <laughs> so these are the two players here. So we start out with uh, with Huben, 612 tons of gold. That's our total holdings. It's worth about 35 billion euros at the moment. And we have diversified it around the world as a good investor should. We spread it over four locations with about 30% in the Netherlands, just over 30% in New York at the Federal Reserve, over 20% in Canada, and 18% in London. It's funny, mm -hmm. Canada as a country doesn't own any cent any any gold, yet they're yeah. custodying it for other countries, which is kind of funny. Yeah, England sold half their gold right at the very bottom. And uh, yeah, and Canada, all of it. And uh, so, you know, <clears throat> people... Uh, don't realize that the U.S. dollar is backed by gold. If you look at the Federal Reserve's uh, H.4.1 release and you go down to the final column, uh, it talks about the 
uh, base cur the currency in circulation. So Federal Reserve notes, what backs those? And currently they are backed 0.4% against, against uh, gold. So a little less than, you know, for each dollar, there is a little less than half a penny there of gold of the physical Federal Reserve notes. So, um, okay, yeah, uh, go ahead and continue with this. This is good. Sure, yeah. Um, the gold really goes way back. At the end of the 19th century, DNB started accumulating gold, which was important to establish confidence in our currency. Okay, <laughs> that right there is really telling. We can't just like gloss over that. That's like, if you want the currency to be valued at all by people, you got to have gold to back it. So that's, that's a I don't understand time. the need for currency. Uh, things should be priced in money. Everything should be, uh, you know, uh, grams or nanograms of gold and uh, ounces of, well, actually it'd be better to go with grams on everything, grams of silver, uh, kilos, whatever of silver. But um, yeah, continue. This yeah. is good. Uh, the Netherlands but, was on the gold standard at that time. That means money was backed by gold at the central bank. In other words, people could always exchange their banknotes for gold. Okay. That lasted until 1936. After World War II, another monetary system based on gold was introduced, Bretton Woods. More than 40 countries agreed with each other that their currencies had a fixed exchange rate against the dollar. The dollar, in turn, could be exchanged for gold at a fixed price. Yeah, that's Bretton okay. Woods pegging all the world's currencies to gold through the U.S. dollar. Because a lot of people didn't don't realize that when Nixon ended, when he closed the gold window, he severed the tie between gold and all of the uh, national fiat currencies, with the exception of, of a few. Uh, I believe Russia and Switzerland um, maintained a gold standard for a little while longer. Yeah, and I remember learning about this from your videos, Hidden Secrets of Money. You've got the balloon animation tied to gold, and then Nixon just cut it and it floats away. Yeah. Uh, and and all the balloons of all the countries all over the world also you know inflate into the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, I remember that. Um, it's it's great. But yeah, it's, it's great that the the head of the central bank here is just kind of, um, you know, acknowledging that getting everyone on the same page because. What yeah, happened except next? he he, uh, he he says gold and then he says money, meaning uh, their currency. <laughs> yeah. And it's a it's currency backed by money, gold, because gold was the, was the money before the currency existed, you know, uh, and and. All, all currencies, all gold standards, uh, you know, I made a couple of vi a video and I've said many, many times that gold standards suck. It's just a way of cheating gold uh, when you come out with some promise to pay gold. And it's a lie because they always print more promises than they have. Uh, so fundamentally, so gold and silver have been called honest money for centuries. And because it's not a lie, they are not a lie. All of the currencies are a lie right from the beginning. Even when they're gold backed, they're a lie. So, yeah, yeah, gold standards. Okay, awesome. So, Huben containers. The Dutch guilder was was actually stable to gold via the dollar. We received dollars when we had surpluses, and we lost dollars when we had deficits. And the dollars were redeemable in gold. Okay, fine. Nothing new to us. Um, Okay, hang on. I want to move. This is the automatic balancing uh, system that a gold standard would do, where you've got the globe and there would be little bubbles uh, that would happen here and there. A bubble happens because, uh, you know, they, they're uh, experiencing good times. They start importing goods from other countries. And when they import goods, dollars flow out of the, of the bubble country to countries that are having a recession, stimulate that economy. And it grows and might go into a bubble while the one that's in a bubble shrinks. So it's this automated, automatic balancing system that doesn't need anybody trying to manipulate it or guide it. And, and once you introduce the ability to through a either a gold standard or a, uh, you know, which allows a little bit of cheating or just a fiat currency standard like we have now, which allows unlimited cheating until the whole thing implodes. Uh, uh, once you do that, bubbles can become huge. And then when a bubble bursts, there's a lot of pain for everybody. The automatic balancing system that gold uh, imposed, uh, you know, it, it's 
Gold was sort of like gravity. You could not violate it. When a government would try to do too much deficit spending, they had to borrow gold, and that would do something called crowding out, where there's not enough gold in the private community, and banks would have to raise interest rates, and that would slow down the economy, meaning that the government gets less tax revenues. So if the government tried too much crowding out, they would actually reduce the amount. If they... Um, uh, did too much deficit spending or tried to raise taxes too high, they would slow down the economy to where they actually had less income. And so automatic balancing system that uh, nobody, no politician, no banker, no economist could violate. And that's what was great about it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, really the story here that, that we're kind of getting at with the Dutch economy is that they were producing for a long time. They were producing things that the rest of the world wanted and they were shipping it to them, running a surplus and getting a lot of gold as a result. And then what we see in recent years is that they're just selling off that gold and letting other countries have it, which is very strange. Ordinarily, you wouldn't want to do that. And in just a second, we're going to look at some quotes where the, the interviewer asks um, the head of the central bank, why did you do that? Okay. Um, so, so I'll so, stop interrupting you and you can, you can read this now. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, so that's basically the story here. Um, as a result of the surpluses, our gold reserves increased, or we got more dollars that we converted into gold. We kept asking the Americans over the years, can you convert our dollars into gold? We became owners of that gold that was at the Federal Reserve in New York, and it's still there. The Americans made losses from their trade relationships. In other words, the Americans weren't producing as much. Uh, and the rest of the world didn't want their stuff. Eventually, it was unsustainable for them to lose more and more gold reserves. In 1971, President Nixon announced America's departure from Bretton Woods. But by then, we had over 1,700 tons of gold. Yes, we did very well then. So yeah, he's making the point that, yeah, when you create a bunch of stuff that other countries or other people all over the world want to buy, you have a good economy and you get paid for that in money, in uh -huh. gold. And you do better than the countries that don't produce anything. And we did very well then. So that's that's what a good economy is. And that's how it should work. However, then we see that since the 1970s, gold had no role in the monetary system. But we and other countries had substantial reserves. Hooban again. The beauty of gold is that it's stable in value. It retains its value. That's one of the reasons why central banks hold gold. It has intrinsic value, unlike a dollar or any other currency, let alone Bitcoin. Yeah, we'll let alone Bitcoin. We'll talk about it later. Gold has value on its own. It's a fungible product. It's a liquid product. You can buy and sell it almost anywhere in the world. So it's really an outstanding commodity to base an exchange rate system on. So that now we get to the real question. Okay, the, the interviewer asks, we, we sold a bit of our gold starting in the 1990s. Why? Like, why sell it? If it's the result of hard work and having a great economy for decades, why would you just sell it off? Especially if you are just admitting that it has value and it's going to hold value for a long time. Why would you sell it? And Hubin says, well, I think once you let go of tying your exchange rate to gold, then one of the main reasons for holding that is gone. <laughs> So even though you're just saying that it has value and it's going to hold value a long period of time, just because you don't have it tied to the exchange rate, well, you don't need to have it anymore. So you might ask, why are we still holding that gold? Why, why gold and not a portfolio of stocks or bonds or something else? There are a number of things that make gold very attractive to central banks. Gold is like solidified confidence for the central bank. It's something that has historically fulfilled that role. If we ever unexpectedly, okay, if we ever unexpectedly have to create a new currency or a systemic risk arises, the public can have confidence in the central bank because whatever money we issue, money, hmm, yeah, we can back it with the same value in gold. I, th this, is, this is crazy to me because if we unexpectedly have to create a new currency or a systemic risk arises, we, we can handle it with gold, but we can't with a currency. This is admitting that gold is better than the currency, and yet they're selling the gold. I mean, does that strike you as strange, Mike? Well, it strikes me. That, that was back in the 90s when they were selling gold, so it, it probably wasn't uh, Huben uh, doing the selling. Maybe he was uh, uh, with the central bank then, but uh, yet... It, Everything they do strikes me as strange. <laughs> I don't think these people understand fundamental economics. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been on this sort of warpath uh, for 
uh, since 2007 or 2008 of trying to define the difference be, difference between money and currency. And uh, it, it's very, very simple. And there are people that still disagree with, uh, with me. But when I hear somebody uh, call their currency money, I just immediately think, wow, this person doesn't understand what he's talking about. And then uh, the, the very fact that um, the public can have confidence because, because they've got some gold. <laughs> With whatever currency they issue, we can back it. If, if people would just demand, no, we want to actually use the, the gold. There is no reason. You know, today with uh, blockchain and hash graph technologies, with uh, distributed ledgers as secure as they are, there is no reason you couldn't give every atom in an ounce of gold a serial number or, you know, nanograms of gold. And you give them a, a unique uh, identifier and that gets recorded and people can transact with gold. The central bank gold that's in a vault, they don't need to come out with a currency that is another lie where it's got some sort of fractional reserve scheme behind it. Uh, fractional reserve is the uh, evil culprit here. And uh, we really need to, <clears throat> once you go with something that is honest, it, it, it just uh, corrects so many problems in society. The great wealth disparity we have is largely a function of the uh, monetary system itself. And we have what is just uh, decidedly an evil monetary system. It is an enslavement tool. Uh, it's, it's fraud, theft, and enslavement is the foundation of our global monetary system. And we really need to look at the morality of things uh, rather than, you know, all these economists, they, and, and they just sort of brush through things. But when you're uh, creating currency, through somebody uh, deciding to take on debt, uh, that they're going to sign their name to a document where they're going to owe something back in the future. And then the currency is created to uh, take on that debt. What has just happened is new currency was created that diluted the currency supply and stole purchasing power from everybody else. So you're hiring the bank to uh, steal from everybody in society and give it to you. And then, uh, a lot of people get very, very wealthy off of this, and they don't even realize what is making them wealthy. It's that we live in a feudal system. It's just that you can't see it anymore. It's, it's sort of hidden from view. Uh, and that's one thing I'm working on. I've got a new video series that you know about, and I mention it once in a while. But sometime next year, uh, we should be seeing this that shows how this functions. Hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, goldsilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your dealer. And now back to the video. Anyway, go ahead with this article. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, we do have a little bit more here. So Hubin continues in the 1970s. We did that exercise again in the 1980s and 1990s. We looked at how much gold we have and whether that was still in proportion. So that's kind of a weird word. Like, why is he saying in proportion? It's kind of an insurance against systemic risk. And the question was, to what extent should we continue to insure against this kind of systemic risk? So, by the way, right there, I'm, I'm thinking back to this, the original chart we had ensuring against systemic risk, all these countries are increasing their reserves. Boom. After 2008, they're wondering about that systemic risk. Well, go back to that chart for just one second. Not only are they increasing their reserves, all of these central banks, their balance sheets have grown hugely over this period of time. So there, it isn't just they're, they're increasing the other stuff, but they're increasing their gold reserves at a greater rate than the other stuff that's mm -hmm. in their portfolio. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we continuing about the Dutch Central Bank, we looked at what globally, what other major central banks were doing, which is which is interesting. Like, why why would you worry about what other central banks are doing? We concluded that we own too much gold. Ah, 
man, we have too much of a thing that keeps value. We have too much of an insurance policy. We have too much of uh, something that instills confidence. We have too much of it. You know, our stock of gold was then reduced to about the average of the larger gold holding countries in Europe. So this is so interesting. Now, I don't want to like nitpick too much, but I, I can't help but see this. And I'll just point it out. He switches voice here from active voice to passive voice, which is really which is a common um, tactic that people use when they want to deflect responsibility and not really be looked uh, at. So it's kind of like, oh, mistakes were made. Just, just mistakes are, are out there. They were made. But, you know, rather than saying I made a mistake or we made a mistake, then you, then you, you talk in active voice and you take the responsibility. So, you know, he does this here. So instead, you know, we looked at whatever we concluded, right? We are doing the action. It's active voice. And then he says, he doesn't say we reduced our stockpile of gold. He says our stockpile of gold, it was reduced, right? It's just, you know, no, there's yeah. no responsibility there. Like it was just reduced by like a, a phantom. Um, so maybe I'm nitpicking too much, but th this is like, it's usually subconscious that people do this. It's like a way of saying like, ah, don't look at me. I don't, I don't want to be responsible for this. Like it's, you know, look somewhere else. Right. Well, it's uh, it, it's uh, revealing how he actually feels about it. Uh, and uh, he does not feel good about reducing <laughs> about reducing the gold stocks. Uh, and so he, and he's trying to cover that up and play the game and uh, uh, and deflect, like you said. So, yeah. yes. Yeah, exactly. So then the interviewer asks, we we do still rank in the top 10, I think, globally. He says we're number seven in terms of our GDP. Yes, that's a fine position. So it's interesting that they are already sort of speaking the same language about how to rank this, like in terms of GDP, um, mm -hmm. because there's no there's no um, like universal law about measuring your gold as a percentage of GDP. It's just something that central bankers do. Um, so it's interesting that they all kind of agree that that's an appropriate way to value it. So how do you determine what is an appropriate amount then? Because that 35 billion euros, that doesn't quite relate to our GDP, does it? And he says, we have about 4% of our GDP in our gold reserves, and that's comparable to France, Germany, and Italy. And she asks, is that the rule of thumb roughly? Like, you know, should, should it be about 4%? And he says, I think to be very honest, there is no optimum. So you can't determine objectively what is the optimal level of gold reserves, just like with insurance, because you don't know when and to what extent a fire is going to occur and so on. Of course, it has to do with the shocks of the future, with all kinds of uncertain factors. I think it's just that we as Dutch people want to be a little careful. We think it's good to have a certain basis of solvency at the central bank invested in gold. Um, and then finally, just to conclude here, last couple um, quotes here, because you could also say if it's a kind of insurance, for example, if the financial system collapses or whatever, shouldn't you have a lot more, right? Isn't this like the best question? Shouldn't you have a lot more? Yeah. He says, you could think that. I think it's more than enough because if everything collapses, then the value of those gold reserves shoots up. It skyrockets. Second, which is inter an interesting point already, um, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I've heard in the past Ben Bernanke and, and other, um, you know, central bank presidents say, you know, no one understands the price of gold. Um, but he seems the Cuban here seems to think that the price of gold will shoot up. <laughs> yeah. So interesting. That there's I that. said something similar in my first book, you know, when when uh, all of their other assets, when the currencies go bad, the purchasing power is transferred from those currencies to uh, the, the gold. And uh, uh, so it's the gold will skyrocket, but it's because the value of the, the purchasing power that's stored in the uh, currencies that they're holding and all the sovereign bonds they're holding, the other assets, as that vanishes, it's not really vanishing. It's going from those bonds into the gold and the gold becomes much more valuable. Yes. Yeah, it's that shift of energy, um, shifting from one asset class to another. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So, and then he, he finishes by saying, so not only will the value of those gold reserves shoot up, um, but secondly, you don't have to fully cover it. Uh, you, you know, that's what experience shows. Full coverage is only necessary in a country where there are no other mechanisms to support confidence in the central bank. This I would say the gold covers itself. So, <laughs> go yeah, ahead. yeah, exactly. And that's what makes it an honest asset. Is is right. there's no? It's not tied to anything. It just it is itself. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting, and I I can't help but wonder what he means when he says there are no other mechanisms to support confidence. Yeah. 
in the central bank. You know, people, wanna, like, yeah. People need to understand that uh, the dollar, the euro, the yen, these are all derivatives, right? They're a derivative of the asset that's backing them. There's a central bank with a balance sheet and it's got these assets, which are in themselves derivatives. So it's a derivative of a derivative. Yeah. <laughs> and the only thing in this entire chain that is not a derivative that doesn't have counterparty risk is the gold, the foundation. Yeah, exactly. All these currencies for sure are liabilities, like a Federal Reserve yeah. note. A note is a liability for sure. Yeah. Whether it, whether or not it's a derivative, is maybe maybe it depends how we define derivative, but it's certainly not an asset. Like It's not an asset in this way that gold is. It's a liability, right? Um, well, a liability is a promise to pay. What is a promise to pay? It's it, it's a derivative of whatever they're going to pay you. It's, it's that uh, IOU. If the central bank is holding, well, <laughs> anyway, um, okay. Anything else on that article? Um, yeah, I wanted to, to include this chart here. This is Eurozone oh. monetary gold versus GDP um, as of last year, 2022. Uh, so really, the let me just explain the pieces and then I'll explain the main takeaway. So the pieces here are we have monetary gold reserves for different uh, countries in the Eurozone. And that's the gold bar. That's how much gold they have. Mm -hmm. um, then the black bar is GDP. And they're on different scales, but they're they're synchronized so that uh, you can see how closely the gold bars and the black bars are aligned um, vertically. They're at almost the same height for every country, which is very interesting. And you can also see the trend that they've been moving on uh, since the 1990s. So that's these pink or red bars that are stacked on top of the gold bars. So the pink or the red bars are monetary gold sales over the last 30 years. And you can see that for pretty much all these countries that have been selling gold, they're moving their gold stocks in line with their GDP. Mm -hmm. So this is absolutely fascinating. It seems like too much to be a coincidence if things were moved randomly or, or if, if it was sort of a free market, quote unquote, where there was no collusion, you'd expect maybe a third of countries to be going up, a third going down and a third staying the same or something like that with, with yeah. different variability. But instead, we see all of them trending towards the middle. So countries that didn't have gold are accumulating and countries that had a lot of gold are selling. Uh, and it seems very suspicious. And that's that's really the it main does. takeaway here. Well, what I, I get a couple of other things out of this. Uh, you know, Germany is has always been considered a pretty responsible country, and you look at the amount of sales that they've done, and it's almost none. And their gold uh, reserves exceeds their GDP, um, and so they're in a very good position. But look at who's actually in the best position on the chart. Italy has never been <laughs> considered to be a country that's been particularly good or meticulous with their finances. But they are definitely in the best position of all of these compared to their GDP with the uh, amount of gold that they own. And then another interesting thing is that um, Ireland there, um, they're, they've got a GDP and it says gold buyer after 2008. There's almost nothing there. But since that the crisis in that first chart where the convergence happened, uh, Ireland has jumped on board and has, has been a buyer since 2008. But you still don't see much gold uh, behind its GDP bar. So it's in probably the worst uh, condition on here. But as we said earlier, uh, Canada is uh, a country that uh, you know had uh, decent gold stocks and then liquidated all of them at some very low prices. <laughs> and uh, if there is a systemic crisis and we have, a, a, which I do believe is coming, a currency crisis, uh, Canada is just, I mean, they're hung out to dry by their own leaders. So, yep, yep. And uh, that's outside of our control. So anyways, I just wanted to summarize what's been happening. And this is um, this is by the author of of the article we just looked at. OK, so this is this is a, um, a previous article he wrote that's connected with the same story. 
And this is what he says. After putting everything together, I reckon, I reckon the Eurozone's gold strategy is this. And he's got five pieces to it. Number one, for the Eurozone to own an adequate amount of monetary gold relative to the economies outside of Europe based on GDP. Okay. Number two, to have roughly the same gold to GDP ratios in medium and large economies throughout the Eurozone. This objective also serves the first objective. Okay. Number three, to have commensurate total reserves to GDP ratios in all countries in the Eurozone to be able to fine tune gold to GDP ratios before revaluing gold. Okay, that one's a little specific. Um, he elaborates more on that in his other article. Number four, to have before a revaluing gold is what sticks out to me, but go ahead. Yeah, no, and the, and the idea there is to like prepare for uh, a gold standard globally. And, and they will try to revalue gold, but it's basically the free market that ends up revaluing gold. And what they'll do is they will try to stop the revaluation at some uh, uh, point by naming a higher price than what the current free market price is. And this is what they're going to back their currency rather than it to just go into a runaway and their currency to go to absolute zero. Yes. And maybe this is something we could talk about in a future video, but my expectation is exactly what you just said, where they name a much higher price measured in the currencies of the world, much higher price. And then if a bunch of people think they you know, essentially won the lottery, anyone holding gold, a lot of people would sell out and then they would revalue it again higher. So in other words, I'm expecting a two piece move. I don't think they would do it all in one go. Um, okay. but again, we could talk about that later and it's more of a hunch than anything concrete. So, um, just an idea. Yeah. Anyways, let's continue here. Number four. So, so the gold strategy in, in this author's opinion is to have approximately equal gold to total reserve ratios in medium and large economies in the Eurozone. This objective is achieved by adjusting foreign exchange reserves and serves the previous three objectives. OK, and then <laughs> number five, stand ready for a monetary reset. Wow. So what do you think, Mike? Do you agree? Do you agree with that? Uh, well, they're getting <clears throat> the monetary reset is not part of the plan. They will avoid that for as long as they can. That is forced by the free market. Uh, it will be in response. The monetary reset, they, they are laying a, the groundwork. They're putting a plan in place. So that when something happens that that is triggered by uh, uh, bad banking practices and the public's reaction to uh, this phony monetary system uh, starting to crumble, when that starts to happen, uh, they've got a plan in place to replace the uh, phony monetary system with another phony monetary system that has some gold backing it. Yep. I agree completely. They want, they, they want to stay in power. Yes, exactly. And the current system gives them all the power. Um, I think they just feel like they're losing it, like it's slipping because they've, yeah. you know, they've distorted the economy and pushed the energy so far in one direction. It's got to spring back and they can feel it. And they're making preparations for when it inevitably happens against their wishes. So that's what I think. Exactly. Yes. So I want to end with a little meme here. Hi, I need a wake-up call. <laughs> the gold price is not going up. The U.S. dollar is going down. <laughs> As do all fiat currencies. And I want to thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, that was, you know, when I first read that article, I realized how, what an important article it was. Uh, I'm really glad that you put this together so that people could see this. And I urge everybody to go and read the article. Thanks for watching, but this is by no means the whole story. If you want the full story, including my free online-only chapters and companion videos, there's a wealth of information at ggsr21.com. Thanks.